welcome everyone to this beautiful May 1st, May Day. Uh, my grandmother used to say you have to go out and wash your face in the dew in the grass on May 1st if you want to be beautiful all year. So evidently it works, right? Cause I... <laughs> anyway, um, an old Scottish tradition, I guess. So welcome to all of you who are here in the sanctuary, to all of our friends and family who are joining us on live stream. And um, are there any announcements this morning? Good morning. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to one thing in the crier. Um, our Vacation Bible School will be happening this summer. Very excited to have it back. Um, we are looking for a few more volunteers, so if you are interested in helping us, um, we'd love to have you. You can come see me after church. Um, the registration is going to be online only. It is active, so I'm going to send that out soon, and then you should see it in the crier for next week. Um, I also wanted to let you know, we now have in the back of the church a bin of fidgets, little quiet things for your hands. So um, I know sometimes you've probably seen fidget spinners, things like that. If you are somebody who likes to doodle while you sit, if you like to um, do crossword puzzles or knit while you watch TV, these might be for you if it helps you concentrate for the kids and adults too if you need it. They're all silent, so you're not going to disrupt your neighbor. All right, so they're in the back. Just return them after the worship service. Thank you, Val. Um, our service begins with our call to worship, which can be found on page one of your bulletin. <clears throat> o Lord, our God, we praise you. You have restored our lives. Our opening hymn is on page 184 of the Pilgrim Hymnal. join your hearts with mine in prayer for our invocation. Living God, you meet us in unexpected places and surprise us with the abundance of your love. 
Feed us by your word and fill us with your spirit so that we may follow you this day and always through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Our Lord Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. As we are people who have fallen short of these commandments, let us now confess our sin before God and one another, first together in the unison prayer of confession and then individually in silence. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the powers of sin and death and reconciled humanity to yourself. We confess that we have followed the ways of sin and death. We have been unfaithful to our covenant with you and with one another. We have not heeded your commandments. We have worshiped other gods, money, power, greed, and convenience. We have not loved our neighbor as you have commanded, nor have we rightly loved ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, and bring us back into the fullness of our covenant with you and one another. Through Christ our risen Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death has come through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so will all be made alive in Christ. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. be seated and children pre-K through 8 may head down to Sunday school. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Shepherd of souls, you call us to an abundant feast at the table of your word. Open our hearts to feed on your goodness, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may dwell ever more deeply in you. Amen. So the Old Testament reading is from Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 16. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on the day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on the rich pasture of the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, 
and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. The New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two of his other disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Here ends the reading. One of the things my brothers and I did a lot with our dad was go fishing. Now, usually we went fishing with fishing poles, but we did have two nets as well. One net was called a drop net, and that was a small net that was kind of like an upside down umbrella. And we'd use that to catch shiners. So those were the, the bait fish we used for catching bluefish or striped bass. Now, that net really only worked if you could see there were shiners around and had some bait to attract them, and oddly, potato chips were fairly effective. But if there weren't fish around, there was no way this net or our potato chips was going to bring them around. The other net we had was a lot more fun. It was called a a drag net, and that's essentially a, a long rectangular net between two wooden poles. And you'd use that at the beach. So my brothers and I would wade out into the ocean and uh, you'd keep the net, uh, the bottom of the net close to the bottom of the the ground or the bottom of the ocean, I guess. And uh, you'd have one person further out out and one person closer to shore and you'd walk parallel to the beach and eventually you'd have to pivot and the person farther out would bring the net in. And on a good day, 
We'd end up with a ton of little fish and sea creatures we didn't even realize were at the beach. However, on a bad day, we'd only come to shore with seaweed, maybe a potato chip bag, or at worst, a jellyfish we then had to carefully figure out how to put back. So the disciples in our lesson were out fishing, and after a whole night of fishing, they've caught absolutely nothing, not even a jellyfish. Now this lesson takes place sometime after Easter and after Jesus has already appeared to the disciples two times after his resurrection, but we don't actually know how long it's been since Easter. We do, we do know it's been at least a few days since the last time the disciples saw Jesus was in Jerusalem, and now they're at the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee, and that's a few days north of Jerusalem, so it's at least been long enough for them to travel to Galilee. Now as the dawn breaks, the resurrected Jesus stands on the beach and calls out to the disciples, children, you have no fish, have you? But the disciples don't realize it's Jesus. They shout back, we don't have any fish, and then Jesus tells them to put the net down on the other side of the boat. So probably figuring they had nothing to lose, the disciples cast the net off the other side of the boat, and suddenly they have so many fish that they can't haul the net in. And the disciple Jesus loved, who's traditionally thought to be John, he recognizes Jesus by this sign and says to Peter, it is the Lord. Now it's noteworthy that it's this miraculous catch of fish that causes the beloved disciple to recognize Jesus. It's uh, recalling two previous events in the Gospel according to John. The first one is the wedding at Cana where Jesus turns water into an astounding amount of wine that not even a college fraternity could use up in one go. And here Jesus causes the disciples to catch a miraculous number of fish. Now the other event this catch of fish calls to mind is the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus feeds the crowd with only five loaves and two fish, and there was an overabundance of food, more than enough for everyone with 12 baskets left over. So the wine, the catch of fish, the feeding of the 5,000, these are all signs where Jesus is showing people what the abundant grace of God looks like. He's showing what grace upon grace looks like, and God's grace is boundless. There's always enough, and it never runs out. Scripture frequently describes heaven and paradise as like a really wonderful feast filled with every good thing you can think of. So it's certainly consistent that Jesus is showing God's grace through food. Starvation would have been a real problem in Jesus' day, and it, it sometimes still is today, and in that sort of context, the promise of grace, like a feast that never runs out, would have been powerful. Plus, sharing food and eating with other people is something human beings have always done. And I think it's beautiful to think about a good meal with good people as just a, a very small taste of the kingdom of heaven. And communion, theologically, is a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in God's kingdom. Communion joins believers in every time and place together in Christ, and that means we're joined with all those saints of the church who have gone on to glory ahead of us. So once the disciples know it's Jesus on the beach, Peter puts on some clothes because he's been naked for doing work, and then he jumps into the water to get to Jesus rather than waiting for everyone else to get there on the boat. So Peter puts on clothes to jump into the sea. Now that seems pretty odd, but perhaps Peter just felt too vulnerable to stand naked in front of Jesus. That seems pretty relatable. So Peter could have waited for the boat to head in, but he obviously felt he needed to get to Jesus as soon as possible. So putting on clothes to jump into the ocean was his compromise there. So Peter swims ashore and Jesus says for the disciples to bring some of the fish to him and they hand, they haul the net in, and they've caught 153 fish. Now, because 153 is such an exact number, for the past two millennia, church people have asked, what does it mean? And people have done all sorts of like math jujitsu to try and figure out what the number means. 
And uh, St. Augustine noticed that if you add 1 through 17 in sequence to each other, like 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on, that comes out to 153. But no one knows why that would be important. And many other options have been proposed, but the scholarly consensus after two millennia is we don't know. It seems most likely that John is just trying to tell us there were a real lot of fish. So once the disciples make it to the beach, Jesus says, come and have breakfast. And he cooks them up a breakfast of charcoal roasted fish and bread. And then it says, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now, this part makes the breakfast sound a lot like communion. And the early church definitely took this scene as a, a communion scene. And lots of early uh, depictions of communion often went with showing meals of bread and fish rather than bread and wine. And that comes from this scene. And one of the, the things about communion that we're doing during communion is remembering. And on that beach, I'm sure the disciples were remembering the night Jesus was betrayed, particularly Peter. So at the Last Supper, Peter promises to never abandon Jesus. But a few hours later, he denies Jesus three times. Now, one thing you might not recall from that story, though, is that Peter denies Jesus while standing around a charcoal fire. And the only two places charcoal fires are mentioned in the gospel are when Peter denies Jesus and during this breakfast. So as Peter ate breakfast that morning, the very smell of the fire would have probably brought him back to remembering when he denied Jesus. It's worth noting that in the other three Gospels, Peter denies knowing Jesus, but in John, Peter denies being Jesus' disciple. So in John, Peter denies his identity and his purpose rather than simply not knowing Jesus. And Peter denies his identity likely because he was scared about what might happen to him. And certainly that's a reason why people deny aspects of their own identities today. People have all sorts of problems in life when they have to deny aspects of who they are. And the internal tension can be too much to bear. One of my seminary professors did research on some of the earliest Protestant women in the United States to fight to preach in churches. And many of them suffered a lot of health issues from constantly being told that the one thing they felt they were called to do, to preach, wasn't allowed. Denying who they were and having who they were denied hurt on lots of levels. So Jesus is definitely thinking of the night he was betrayed because after breakfast he says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus asked Peter a second time, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus asks a third time, do you love me? And Peter responds with, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. So Peter, having denied Jesus three times, now gets to affirm his love for Jesus three times. So this is Jesus giving Peter a chance for redemption and forgiveness. And this is also about Peter reaffirming his identity as a disciple of Jesus. In John, discipleship is directly tied to love. If we love Jesus, then out of that love flows love of neighbor, love of all the people God loves. <laughs> I think that was a love song. So. <laughs> So in this scene, we see Peter being asked if he loves Jesus, and Jesus responds with, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. This is Jesus reorienting Peter from looking backwards to looking towards the future. Peter, uh, Jesus focuses Peter on his purpose as a disciple of Christ, as a disciple of the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Another thing Jesus does in this exchange is tell uh, Peter that Peter's going to die. So Jesus is alluding to how Peter will eventually be martyred, actually crucified, during a period of persecution. And now that, that seems a depressing thing to let someone know. But at the Last Supper, Peter had promised to follow Jesus even to death. 
but then hours later ended up denying he was Jesus' disciple. So Jesus here is letting Peter know that Peter's actually going to be able to keep his promise the next time. The next time Peter's not going to get scared or back out, he's going to say, stay true to who he is. And during the Last Supper, Jesus tells the disciples that there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Peter is going to love his friends the way Jesus loved him. One of the major aspects of the good news that Jesus brings is the good news of repentance. It's the good news that there's possibility for turning around. There's possibility to turn away from sin and towards life. It's the good news that second chances are possible. And in this lesson, we watch Peter repent. We watch him reorient his life towards Jesus after royally messing up just a few chapters before. And in our position, millennia in the future, we know that Peter is able to keep following Jesus even to the end. Peter is proof here of the good news that our God is a God of second chances. God doesn't give up on us when we mess up, fall short, or run into difficulty. Our God is in the savior business. The good news is that none of us are beyond being turned around, that the world isn't too broken to be put right. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter who you love, no matter where you're from, no matter what you look like, no matter what you've done, the salvation of God, the grace of God, the love of God, and the kingdom of God are for you. And Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, is always there to welcome us home into the fold. Amen. Our hymn is Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us in your New Century Hymnal. It's number 252. Now, when you open the hymn, you'll see there are two verse ones. And sadly, I neglected to warn you all to brush up on your Hawaiian. <laughs> so we're going to sing the verse one that's in English, followed by verses two and three.
we come now to the time in our service where we pray for the world and one another. And I asked this morning, are there any joys that people would like to lift up? Howard. At some point in the next hour, Barbara and I will be celebrating our first 40 years together as husband and wife. So congratulations on your 40th anniversary. <laughs> Stephanie. So thanksgiving for prayers and for a, a good surgery and also prayers that things continue to go well. Norma. My son, uh, Derek, was home for a week. I hadn't seen him since October with our grandchild. That was nice to see him. So you got to see uh, Thanksgiving for getting to see your son, Derek, and your grandchild and uh, spending time together for the first time since the fall. Uh, I want to thank uh, offer up prayers of thanksgiving for everyone who was here helping uh, tidy everything up yesterday outside and thank you especially to all of the scouts who were a huge help and also to all of you who were here as well. Uh, things look very spiffy so thank you all. <laughs> Are there any concerns people would like to lift up today? Brenda. My So prayers for your sister-in-law who's pregnant with twins and has uh, come down with COVID. So prayers that things go all right. Uh, for prayers that were sent in, uh, we ask prayers for uh, peace everywhere and an end to all war. We ask prayers for all those affected by mental illness. Prayers for teen's sister, Roxanne, who's uh, struggling with Alzheimer's. Prayers for all those who are uh, struggling with COVID and all those struggling with cancer. And we ask prayers for Christians around the world and our US servicemen and women. So let us take a moment of silent prayer to lift up all those prayers that we heard and all the prayers that are still on our hearts. Holy God, you search us and know us. You call us by name out of death into your fold and show us your ways of love and life abundant. We thank you for the beauty of creation, for all the ways you fill our lives with abundance, goodness, and blessing. We thank you for our friends, family, mentors, and community. And we thank you most of all for sending your son, Jesus Christ, so that we might have everlasting life. We pray for Christians near and far and for the whole church that we may be devoted to your word and to universal fellowship, being generous to all who have need. We pray for the earth, that we may be good stewards of your creation. We pray for leaders of our nation and all the nations around the world, that they be guided by your wisdom and justice, so that all may dwell in peace without fear. We pray for relief for refugees, for release to the captives, and for good news to the poor. We ask the, that the oppressed be set free and that the persecuted no longer fear. We pray that the hungry be fed and the downtrodden be lifted up. We pray for those who are sick, that they may be restored to wholeness of life and livelihood. We pray for our enemies, that we may regard them with the reconciling love made manifest in Christ. We pray for the lost and those who have abandoned God, friends or family, and for those who have never known such love that they may come to know the joy of love's embrace. We pray for the dying, that they know the hope and comfort that only you can bring. We pray for those who mourn, that their broken hearts be bound up. We pray for those undergoing divorce or separation, that they know your guiding and healing presence in a time of upheaval and change. We ask that all those who are entering into times of transition find your love and guidance and get the support they need. Help all those who struggle with substance abuse and continue to sustain those in recovery. We pray for the safety and good health of our loved ones near and far. Grant that we, the sheep of your flock, may minister in your name with your love in our hearts 
your truth in our minds, and your strength in our wills, until the end of our journey, when we with all your faithful saints will dwell with you in the splendor of your heavenly kingdom. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. Amen. In thanksgiving for the love of God made known to us in Christ, let us present our offerings of commitment and support for the work of Christ's church. The morning offering will now be received. Please join me in the prayer of dedication printed in your bulletin. Loving God, you gave your son Jesus Christ to be the good shepherd and in his love for us to lay down his life and rise again. Keep us always under his protection and give us grace to follow in his steps to do his work in the world. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in God's kingdom. When our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed it and gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table and he invites those who trust in him to keep the feast. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. You formed us from the dust of the earth and set us among your creatures to love and serve you. When we were unfaithful to you, you kept faith with us. Your love remained steadfast. You led us out of bondage and through the desert. You made covenant to be our God. You spoke of love and justice in the prophets and in the word made flesh, you lived among us manifesting your glory and delivering us from death. Your son, Jesus Christ, came bringing healing, mercy, and peace, and he was wounded, mocked, and killed. 
By your power, he broke free from the prison of the tomb, and at his command, the gates of hell were opened. The one who is dead now lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation, the lamb upon the throne. We ask that you pour out your spirit upon us, that we who receive this sacrament may be united with Christ and one another and with believers in every time and place. We ask this in the name of your son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. We remember on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes to us again. It is our custom here to wait until all have been served so that we may consume the elements together. We start first with the, the bread and then the cup. And this represents our unity in Christ. So come, for all things are now ready. body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The 
blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving printed in your bulletin. Gracious God, we give you thanks that by the witness of your word and the sharing of this meal, you have opened our hearts and eyes to the presence of Christ among us. Now send us forth from this place by the power of your spirit to tell this good news to the world. The Lord is risen indeed. Amen. peace to love and serve the Lord. And as you go, may the grace and peace of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>